So, welcome. Okay. So, um, so tonight in this Canadian place in British Columbia, I will be bringing to you a sense of the spectacular developments now occurring in the United States, uh, which are about the beginning of the takedown of the enforcement arm, which is also the protection arm, if not also the frame-up arm and blackmail arm of the empire. The machinery of enforcement is under attack in the United States. And this is not going to be clear to most people outside of the United States, and it's probably not going to be clear to most people in the United States. Now, what is going on in the U.S. has incredible ramifications all over the world, including possibly, if we do our job, leading as part of this process to the exoneration of Lyndon LaRouche, which is much more significant than most people realize. The role, the role of LaRouche before he was uh, railroaded in prison and, and how that was used to shut down the discussion that was going on all over the world. The US arm of this is centered in the FBI and the Justice Department. It has been closely linked to Wall Street and the city of London since its origins, uh, it, the FBI did not start them, but it was, its origins were in the Teddy Roosevelt administration, which followed the McKinley assassination. So beginning in the 20th century, this apparatus has been growing and has been had a cont continuity. Whenever there is a political threat to the empire, even if one not defined, or a potential political threat, or there is resistance to a policy being implemented by the empire or some kind of reform of that type, like deregulation. This apparatus is activated with the help of the media and a corrupt judicial system. So, so you have a, a um, you might say you have a, um, a, a, three, a three, three components. The media, which tries you in the press. The, the enforcement arm and, this, and the court system. That's your three, uh, that's your three, that's your, that's your uh, triangle. Two recent examples of this which are very glaring. One is in 2008, when the mortgage-backed security crisis occurred, uh, there was a Senate investigation and they discovered massive fraud in the way the whole thing was run. Very clear criminal violations by financial institutions. This was then referred to the Obama administration. Uh, actually, it wasn't the Obama administration. It might, yeah, yeah, it was the Obama administration. Obama was in by then because it's after, after the election. Although I'm not sure. It was referred to the Justice Department. The Department of Justice did not say there was no crimes. The Department of Justice criminal division head, Lanny Brewer, said, and you all remember this, perhaps, that we could not, we cannot prosecute because it might threaten to co collapse the financial system. In other words, this is where the origin of the term too big to fail, too big to jail. Mm -hmm. A second glaring example involved the investigation into the HSBC, Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, which, which was caught red-handed laundering tens of billions of dollars from the drug cart. No question. The U.S. attorney, 
at that time in New York. Her name was Loretta Lynch. Uh, settled with HSBC with a, with a relatively meager fine. And that was it. Not coincidentally, Loretta Lynch then became the new Attorney General. Same thing, something similar occurred with James Comey, who succeeded Robert Mueller as head of the, uh, Mueller as head of the FBI, before he was tapped to replace his close friend and protector, Robert Mueller, who was the 9-11, uh, 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 protected the 9-11 situation and was and helped create the surveillance state. James Comey was on the international board of guess what? HSBC. So there's this very close relationship between the British drug trade and the Justice Department and the protection of 9-11. Of so the British Empire's leading drug empire bank for for however long it's been around, perhaps as long as 200 years, it, you know, is directly involved, you know, this is the system. Welcome to uh, justice. Meanwhile, entire nations are being destroyed by the drug trade. Then, of course, you have a 10-year war with the Justice Department against Lyndon LaRouche and Associates. Everything now being attacked, being driven against Trump, everything, everything going after Trump comes from the same apparatus, including Mueller's role in the LaRouche case, Mueller's role in the LaRouche case. This apparatus was further expanded since the LaRouche case by the emergence after 9-11 of the surveillance state made possible initially by the Patriot Act. One of the individuals fighting this since 2001 is Bill Binney. Bill Binney was going, was the technical director of the NSA. That is the chief technical person at the NSA, National Security Agency, the surveillance agency. He had developed a plan a program that would have caught the terrorists and they wouldn't go with it. Instead of his plan, which did not involve surveilling the population, they preferred to have a massive surveillance of the population. And you can... Uh... Now, currently, Benny is at the center of this uh, takedown of the, of, the, of the Justice Department. And I will also mention here that Donald Trump, on the eve of 9-11, said that he knew how the buildings were built, constructed. He, he, was, he was close to the people who built it. And he said it would be impossible for the plane. And the, the truth movement got sidetracked in a thousand different ways, but nonetheless, it is believed that Trump put in some money. So... The control is breaking, and I'll go into this a little bit. The LaRouche case, however, is very important because LaRouche was brought into the extended institutions of the presidency under Reagan. He was involved in dialogues with leaders all over the world. Many sectors in Europe, Asia, Latin America, and Africa were in a dialogue with LaRouche. After he was railroaded, however, all these people were personally threatened by the FBI or the CIA or the State Department for, for, for having any kind of contact with, with the LaRouche move. So any further, a lot of the contact that occurred after that had to be done quietly. And it's still being done quietly because of the, the railroading of Lyndon LaRouche. <laughs> the very ideas associated with LaRouche have become somewhat taboo. This was also made more explicit by the assassination of Herrhausen and Rollover, who in Germany were supporting policies identical to what LaRouche was proposing for the, for, for the post-fall of, of, of the wall for developing Eastern Europe. 
Perhausen was the banker for Deutsche Bank before <coughs> Deutsche Bank got reorganized. And his whole idea was to develop East, Eastern Europe and use that to, to expand the industrial capability of Europe as a whole, which was LaRouche's policy. And Rollover was put in charge of, the, after, the, after uh, East Germany was unified, there was a period where Roller was, was put in charge of the, of the, of, of the state industries, the state industries of, of, of the DDR, of, 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 of East Germany. And his whole idea was to, was to keep these things open, even though they were at a less, less advanced in some ways than the Western, but to keep them open, keep them production, keep the people in, in production so that you could develop. Eastern Europe. And he was assassinated. And then it was shut down. Okay? And Helmut Kohl, who at that time was Chancellor of Germany, later said he had lived under the threat of assassination. He had he was forced to accept the price that the price for German unification was the was the was was Germany agreeing to the European Union. And the European Union is what we will be opposed from the very beginning because it was a, an attack on development. And we forecast the consequences of this European Union. So that was a turning point in Germany. The, Germany was broken politically as, in any way as an independent. And the, and the new political elite that emerged out of Germany have been extremely servile to everything that was being promoted out of London. Uh, I say this because Donald Trump, starting with the Roger Stone case, is now on an offensive to destroy this apparatus that went after him and had earlier gone after LaRouche and gone after African-American politicians, gone after trade union leaders, uh, protected the assassins of King, you know, on and on and on and on. This apparatus protects organized crime, protects the drug cartels, protects the international banks, and on and on and on. This is the power that it fears, it blackmails, it surveils, that, uh, and then Biddy has exposed, uh, Bill Biddy has exposed something called the Hammer Program, which is just coming out, where the CIA director, Brennan, and, uh, Clapper, head of the intelligence, had a secret special system of computers to monitor judges, politicians, senators, all the important officials, monitor them ex extensively. And also this program, these, this computer and this program had the capacity not just to, to monitor, but to, but to actually place on their computer, damaging information like child pornography or, 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 or secret documents or classified documents, which could then be discovered on their computer and could be used to, to, uh, to blackmail them and, and threaten them with criminal proceedings. That's the kind of thing that you were, you're, you were dealing with in this surveillance state. Of course, you know about Snowden and all of that. The most Julian Assange. And Julian Assange, you've heard all about that. And that whole thing is still going. Okay. <laughs> now. Paul, excuse me. Um, I don't know if you know this, uh, an important whistleblower for the um, uh, one of the security agencies uh, was found if you like, uh, suicide recent today. Today, okay. it's in it's in your head. Well, I'm not surprised. So uh, that should be checked. Yep. Okay. The pattern. So the question is, how 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 can Trump do this? Okay. The primary me mechanism that Trump is using is his tweets, and the way he's gradually moving the population into a negative 
attitude, increasing negative attitude towards the criminal justice system of the United States. This is huge. And he, you know, we've gone through the, the revelations of Christopher Seal. Now he has taken the Roger Stone case, gone after the, gone after it, and then, then the blowback was huge against him, threatening to impeach uh, Bill Barr. And then, it, and then it was exposed that the, the judge and especially the head juror were active parts parts of the resistance. And so that's blowing up everywhere. And this is this is causing a process in the population of a reflection on on something many people understand, which is the the unjustice, injustice of the justice system of the United States, the criminality, protecting the, the, the big criminals, prosecuting the little criminals, and prosecuting and anybody that stands in the way of the agendas. Mm -hmm. This reality is now becoming shared consciously by the president. It's not that the president himself is going to issue direct is going to directly move in, 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 in this way initially, but he's creating the environment for that through these kind of in, interventions. <coughs> so, so, so the freak out was such so great that they're calling for the impeachment of Bill Barr, the resignation of Bill Barr, you know, a thousand plus DOJ alumni call for the resignation of Bill Barr, all the judges were about to call for the resignation of Bill Barr and the judges associated, and they backed out. I think they realized they were being set up. Okay. Now, and this is this is very hard to, to viscerally sense if you're a Canadian because this is not what goes on in Canada, but it is going on in the US. And I'm telling you, the people are starting to get to a certain point where it's being socialized just how unjust the American political system, the American criminal justice system is. Now, the three components that I, that I named, the media, the enforcement apparatus, and the courts, the corrupt courts, the one that's, that, that's the, the, the most important one is the media. And the media has to be there to label, define, accuse, and say whatever about anybody. And, uh, okay. And this media control has started to collapse in the US, spectacularly or the control over the US population has been broken. And this is, ex this is something ex spectacular. There's, a, there's, a, 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 there's a, something that Václav Havel, who was the first um, president of Czechoslovakia after, before it broke up and after the, the fall of the wall, he said, we knew we were headed towards a revolution when I realized at a certain point, none of the people, nobody in the population was paying any more attention to the regime control of the media. Nobody was paying attention. It had nothing to do with it. It was garbage. Well, we're getting something like that going on in the United States. The place where you perhaps can see this the most is in the presidential race. Uh, you see it in the huge Trump rallies, which are actually increasing as the demonization and attacks on Trump increase. But you also see it in the Democratic presidential race with the increasing support for Bernie Sanders. I, this is this 78-year-old heart attack guy who's, you listen to him and you think you're talking to your great-great-grandfather or something. And he has the same thing, he says the same thing every time. Why is he the most popular Democrat running? Because he keeps saying, 
the enemy is the one percent 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 and he has a lot of these dedicated fanatic young people supporting him and they are out there campaigning for him and that's you don't see that with any of these other candidates they don't have does joe biden have a bunch of young guys going out there campaigning for him no he doesn't have anybody just just the obama apparatus so so he's coming under attack and the more they attack him, the more his uh, increase. So you have to ask yourself, what's going on? Well, the, the attack on Tr Sanders is, can be seen, it's a flip. The attack on Sanders is flipped. It's, a, it's become a certification rather than a decertification. The attack on him is a certification of, his, of, of who he is rather than a decertification. That's the flip that's going on in the media, with the media, when they broke the control. So, in desperation, they're making the claim now that Russia is making this huge intervention <laughs> into the U.S. elections. No evidence. Russia <laughs> But, you know, Russia's going to be running the elections in the United States. And I mean, this is so wild. But that's what they're saying. And then they went to Bernie Sanders and, and told him that Russia was running a campaign. And he said, well, those must be the people that, that, have, that have been misrepresenting me because there's a big complaints about his, some of his campaign people. Yet no evidence is presented. So this is how far the thing has gone. This is how far the thing has gone. Okay. And so Trump responds to the, sentence, to the sentencing recommendations of Roger Stone. And the brouhaha has now led into an open attack on the criminal justice system. And right after this, what does he do? He pardons some very key people who are victims of the system. And for, but not, one was uh, uh, Bogoyevich, the former governor of, of uh, Michigan. Illinois, oh. who, who who allegedly sold the seat that Obama vacated because the governors get to appoint the, the uh, if, if somebody leaves the Senate seat open and the governor gets to appoint him until there's another election. So allegedly he, he, he got a big bribe to, 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 to get somebody in. But that's not why he was gone after. He was gone after because he, he crossed with Obama. And Obama sick the Justice Department. And he got 14 years. That was Obama. That's Obama's approach. And so essentially, Trump commuted his sentence. Right? And he was a popular governor. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, he says this is an unjust sentence. That's an attack on the, on the judicial system. He also pardoned the New York uh, chief of police, Kirk who also was a victim of this kind of political attack. And then, he made, he, as he was discussing the Roger Stone case before a bunch of uh, convicted felons who are in a special program and were getting special skills, he says that, he said, Roger Stone was treated unfairly, but I guess you guys all understand this. <laughs> in other words, he's saying to the, to, and then he has a huge campaign now to begin this, begin the process of rectifying uh, the worst cases of judicial uh, uh, abuse in the country, with tens of thousands of, pe of people being thrown in jail because of corrupt justices. Why is he doing that? Because he's preparing to take it down. And. So he's preparing to be involved in, in reversing thousands of unjustly convicted people. He's saying to the American people, I want a, 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 a fair criminal justice system. I want a fair justice system. Not one that rewards the people that have the means and are connected in that, and those that penalize those that don't. So this is important because a lot of the population out there has gone to prison or has been a, a victim of this. 
Now, this does not include the other side of the situation, which is Rob, uh, Bill Barr's three prosecutors. There are now three prosecutors outside of Washington, D.C., who are uh, looking for criminal, uh, are involved in criminal investigations into elements of the FISA warrant or uh, what happened with Jim Flynn. There's a whole, there's, a, there's this whole process going on where at some point, there will be criminal indictments of key people. They backed off on, 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 on McCabe because they didn't have a good case and they didn't want to, they didn't want to, to blow, you know, it was, they decided to let that one go. But, but there is this process going on. So Trump is not backing down. These pardonings are a flank. So the question is, can LaRouche be not far behind if this process uh, grows? Because that's going to be the issue. Because he was he was railroaded by the same people in the most in the greater war we fought, and it was a greater war. So now this whole attack on the criminal justice system, which is now starting under, also uh, overlaps with the issue of Pompeo. Pompeo is right now mobilizing everything he can to disrupt everything that Trump is doing. He's giving Turkey the green light to go to war with Russia and Syria, whereas the US military isn't going along. Uh, he's do, he, he, he went to uh, Wakunda or the Munich Security Council uh, with Nancy Pelosi and went all out against China. You know, the, the danger of China, you know, all of it, just, just a psychotic rant. He went to, the, to three African countries, which, are, which are, have very large Chinese involvement, attacked China, but didn't offer any alternative, didn't offer any programs, just, just went on a total blitz attacking China. He's going everywhere attacking China, Latin America, Eastern Europe, everywhere, supporting Ukraine. I mean, he's doing, he's doing a, out, he's out, he's out doing Bolton. But then again, he doesn't have the same kind of uh, approach as Bolton. So, so what, where, are, so we are, we have, we have, uh, we have found a weak spot in Pompeo, and that is, um, Donald Trump asked Bill Binney two years ago to, he asked Pompeo, who was then CIA director, to meet with Bill Binney to get the full story on why the Russians did not hack the DNC computers, but rather it was a download. Now, this may seem very technical, but it is at the center of the entire uh, situation. It's at the center of everything. Because the entire narrative about Russia's in, in intervention into the U, U.S. elections is centered on the DNC hack. Okay. Now, hold up. Okay. Now, so several years ago, Trump sat down with Pompeo. I mean, Benny sat down with Trump. Uh, Pompeo went through all of this. Benny, Trump, uh, Pompeo did not object. You know, he's been in the intelligence community. He was in the Congress, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that was the end of it. And he still maintained that the Russians intervened since then. So we've been pushing this whole angle. And the Russia hack is at the center of this whole question. And uh, we've been having conferences, we've been having, uh, Bill Binney has been on our Thursday night um, uh, fireside chats, Consortium News has been publishing it, we've been going all over the place with this. And we got a breakthrough the other day. One of the leading right-wing uh, pro-Trump networks, close to Trump, 
uh, someone, something called Gateway Pundit, retweet, reposted something that was put in uh, in uh, uh, in another block. Uh, if true, his Pompeo's actions, meaning with regard to Vinny, prevented the termination of the Mueller witch hunt and the Ukrainian scam impeachment. So the so what work what is being said and uh, through this is that uh, is that Pompeo's response to Bill Binney's brief and proof forensically that there was no hack is now going to be circulating in all these Trump circles and in all these Trump circles it's going to be you know why didn't Trump why didn't at when he was CI director, why didn't Pompeo um, uh, go after go after this? This was an opportunity to clean up the mess. Just go up front with what Bill Binney had said, had put together, which is what Trump had asked Bill Binney to uh, had asked Pompeo to listen to Bill Binney. But keep going back to 9/11. Keep going back to the effect that 9/11 had on Donald Trump. Okay, now, so this is very important as the first step to undermine the influence of Pompeo in, in, the, in, in that whole environment. Okay, so, so Pompeo is not protecting, is not interested in protecting Donald Trump. So, so this is now, Biddy will be on the next fireside chat at, on Thursday. And then we have a conference on the 29th, which is Saturday, which is not going to be available uh, because it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Schiller Institute conference. But Bill Benny will be speaking at that. And I think Helga will speak from, from a distance. And we, we might have it later. We might have an edited version of it later. But this is, um, so this is, we're moving on this in a very big way. And uh, keep in mind, all of this can lead to the exoneration of LaRouche and then creating, once you do that, then people will say, okay, I can, we can now talk about these policies. And so, so exposing the fraud of Russia's hack in, uh, is intricately tied to the takedown of the enforcement arm of the empire as well as to the to the Mike Pompeo and intricately connected to the international situation. Taking down the internal enforcement apparatus is also the issue surrounding Attorney General Bill Barr now empowering two, uh, two new prosecutors, three of them total. And I always talked about the, the lawyer on uh, the head, the head, um, the head juror in uh, the Roger Stone case being a, a lawyer and, an, and a resistor. Trump resistor, openly. So, so what's important here is to understand how this will affect the rest of the world, including Canada, which has been subservient to this corrupt enforcement apparatus, as you see in the main situation. Canada has a double problem. They have the British intelligence and that whole apparatus under the crown, and then they have this other apparatus in the US, which is connected, it's, it's tied to it, but but you know, it's it's a so the main case is an example of the influence of this apparatus in the United States. I mean, in Canada. What case? The main main main. How my Huawei. Huawei. Okay. So if Trump is going to move with to have that summit with Russia, China, etc., taking down this crypt, this enforcement arm is very important. And in this context, you have the LaRouche exoneration in the offing. And it could have happened at the point that Trump wants to blow things up the most. Is say the LaRouche thing, do the LaRouche thing. And if he does that, it'll, it'll go everywhere. It'll be total international. He, he will be attacked. And he, he, but he sets it up that way. He does stuff like that. He sets them up to attack him. And then that creates greater support for him. But that would have to come at a certain moment. And I'm just, maybe I'm being, being overly optimistic, but anyhow. 
So now we come to the extension of this into the electoral process, into the election campaign. So all of this has impacted the 2020 election process. What has happened is that in their assault on Donald Trump, the establishment has sacrificed having a viable political candidate that could compete with Trump on who, uh, on who would be uh, best able to better the lives of the population. You know, typically, in a situation like this, in a typical situation, what you do is you find a candidate who, who can out-Trump Trump or who can say, well, I, I don't like Trump's approach, I have a better approach. But, but these are the policies, and these are the policies you, uh, and so forth. But that didn't happen. And he could be, he could be a totally, that candidate could be a total lie. But they understand that people want development, they want a, uh, you know, a better life, they want industry, they want this, you know, you know, you can lie to them, you can lie to them all you want, you can say whatever you want. If, not even be serious about it, but you're competing against a person who already has that policy. And that's how often this will happen. And then, and then once you establish that you're kind of in the same, then, then it becomes all the personal stuff and all, all that crap. But, but that's not what happened. All the Democratic candidates have gone greener than green. You know, it, it's totally, they sacrifice, they, sac they sacrifice. There's a narrative they want to maintain and they want to maintain control, not so much, they want to maintain control over the narrative. That's the most important thing. It's not about who's gonna win the election, it's about maintaining control of the narrative. And the most likely candidate who's doing, who, to do well in the Super Tuesday, which is a week from, which is, um, March, the 3rd. Which is March the 3rd, is going to be Bernie Sanders because he's the only one with any real support in, in the grassroots, in his grassroots. Now, the caucuses are much more weighted towards grassroots because people have to show up. So in Nevada, as of last reporting I saw of 60%, 46% are for Sanders, 19.6% were for Biden, 15.3%. 15.3% were for Buttigieg, and 10.1% was for Warren. Those are the four top candidates. There's a huge break there. The, the summation of those three secondary leading candidates is, is, a little, is about a percent more than what Sanders is getting. That's huge. But that's the caucuses. Then you have the South Carolina primary of Tuesday, which is the 25th, I believe. And then you have Super Tuesday. If Sanders cleans up in all of these, comes out ahead in all of these, and has a, has a, uh, has, this is going to cause a, an extreme problem for the establishment. Not because Sanders is, 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 is a good candidate, and not because he's, he's going to have a good policy, but because he is not their candidate. This is not the one they want to run against Trump. And not only that, Sanders cannot be counted on to, to take the message and the narrative they want to take to, to control the narrative. Wall Street doesn't like him. The city of London doesn't like him because he's against the 1%. This means that it will be difficult to script the anti-Trump narrative with all the other operations being run inside the government. So you have essentially, the purpose of the anti-Trump narrative is to provide protection for the, in, the actual insurrection which is going on inside the government, which is what you see with Pompeo and what you see in other areas. But Trump is steadily moving to break, to clean, to clean out the National Security Council. Now he went after this, he went after that. He fired a very important general. So that there, is this, there is this motion going on towards cleaning uh, cleaning things out. But how do you keep the resistance going inside the government? How do you keep potentially get the option of getting a war going, getting Trump to go to war? How do you 
keep all that going, but you have to have an external narrative, which is Russia's running things. Russia is intervening, and other narratives. So, so Bernie Sanders isn't going to help on that as much as, as, much as they need. So <laughs> this is where Bloomberg comes in. And he didn't do very well in the debates, and he's not going to do very well in the debates. That's not his, that's not his specialty, debating people. He never had to debate anybody. He just had to tell them to go, you know, you do this or I'll kill you, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> you know, he's not there to, de he's not, I'm not there to debate you. I'm there to tell you what is. Period. That's it. And the stories I have of him in New York City are incredible. He needed to get the tax revenue up in New, in New York City, so what he did is he, he created all these little laws on fines. To fine you for this, fine you for that. For instance, if you were riding a bike and you didn't have both feet on the both feet on the pedal, you got fined. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, now it doesn't matter how badly Bloomberg flops per se. Is you know he we'll see what happens Super Tuesday. He's on the ballot in, in this case. He wasn't on the ballot. He wasn't part of the Nevada. He, he's on the ballot in South Carolina. We'll see how he does there. And, and, but by nomination time, if there is a broker convention, which is likely because the superdelegates are not with uh, Bernie Sanders, then Sir Michael Bloomberg can come in uh, as the broker candidate. Also, you know, if there's the other faction that all these people that are a part of this political apparatus you know, they make a living doing this. And where are they going to get the money? Hillary isn't there to spend, you know, 600, uh, I don't know how much she spent. Two, three billion dollars. I don't know how much Hillary spent. But she gave, a lot of money came out of Hillary, you know, to, to support a big apparatus. So who, who's out there that can put up the money or can raise the money to sustain these political operatives. Like, well, you know, there's Bloomberg. Bring him in. Let the cash flow. You know, that's also a consideration for these people because they don't have a Hillary Clinton. You know, Bernie Sanders' contributions are primarily on the smaller side. And most of, he has a lot of uh, people. He's not hiring those people. They need to be hired. They need money. They have a lot of expenses. So that's also a, 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 a so, so with Sir Michael Bloomberg, who's willing to spend up to $5 billion of the $60 billion fortune, maybe only $2 billion, but he, I think he's willing to spend up to $5 billion, to sustain the narrative against Trump, Russia, China, and the green climate emergency throughout the campaign, this is what he will do with these ads. So, so the very discredited media will be massively bombarded with it. Already, people can't can't watch a television show without hear, without getting from this, you know, these commercials. You know, Mike will pull things. Mike will do it. That's the commercial. Mike will do it. Do what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's as if they think the population is in the same frame of mind as they were before. They're not. They're not. The population is not where they say it, where they think it is. So, so this is this is how incredibly insane the situation is. Meanwhile, thousands and thousands and thousands of operatives are now coming on to join Bloomberg. So he may have an army by the time of the, if he does get the nomination by the time of the, he may have a thousand, hundred thousand people out there. <laughs> All being paid. Maybe I'm exaggerating. So it is this effort to keep in place. So all of this is the effort to keep in place the, the structures of power, the enforcement arm, and everything that is determining uh, to prevent Trump from from exercising his power as president to have a, to have a relationship with Russia, China, and India, and Japan, and why? 
that gets to the big issue that I've always said, and it's the big issue of all, is pop goes the weasel. That's when you gotta have everybody on, you know, prepared to come in with a new system. And that's the issue of Donald Trump. Donald Trump, does Donald Trump know this? I'm sure he does. I'm sure he knows. Uh, his, his, uh, one of the people that he's proposing for, for Federal Reserve Chairman is talking about a, a, a gold reserve in the exchange system. Um, uh, forgot her name. Anyhow, she's, okay. So, so this hysteria is growing. And, and, and Trump is not backing down. He's actually trying to probably provoke more hysteria. He wants, he, he plays off the hysteria. He has a tweeter, he tweets. Now, let's go to Europe. A similar process is going on in Europe. Uh, Sinn Féin did very well in Ireland. They came, you know, the three parties came, were very close to each other, but, but now Sinn Féin is at the level of the other parties, of the three parties, 30 percent or so, 30 some percent. That's big. Um, There's a huge battle in Italy over the one guy standing firm, uh, Salvini. Matteo, Matteo Salvini, Matteo Salvini, and, and he's going to trial for his because he was the uh, uh, justice minister who went after the immigration, the migration, and they're claiming he he violated some laws and, and so forth and so on. And this is only making him more popular in. So this little party called was was initially a separatist party, the Lombard of the Lombard region is about to become the national party because its leader and its organization is not going along with the neoliberal uh, policy. So that's another area. That's the League of North. League of North, yeah. Now, the situation in Germany is absolutely freaked out beyond belief. Helga's been talking to us about it. There was these Thuringia elections and the leading party came in with uh, the most votes was the alternative for Deutschland, which is a real mixed bag of right-wing nutcases and decent people. It, it has problems. It has a lot of weird crap in it. But the people are responding to the to the to the insanity of the government with the green stuff. You have massive farmer demonstrations, tractor demonstrations against the green agenda in Germany. The whole situation is crazy. But the entire political elite of Germany is absolutely under control. They bought in to the to the to the euro and the British system and everything, and they're the most lockstep promoting the green the green deal anti-nuclear everything and the popularity of these parties is collapsing and the alternative for Deutschland is becoming the major party and this is like you know they, they don't know how to deal with this so there was this guy who was a rabid Malthusian wanted to eliminate all the people of India who went around into the hookah bars and, and committed the terrorist attacks that killed 10 people, well, because they identify him as a right winger, they're talking about using that incident to get the German uh, courts and the German police to uh, outlaw the AFD, a major party. Outlaw a major party. That, that's really an overreaction to, to a crisis. Whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know, but if they do something like that, Germany is going to go into a, a, an incredible political crisis where they, they can't control it. The, the government is finished. And, but there's nobody really capable of coming in. Unlike Italy, you have Salvini, other places you have other people. You don't have anybody that hasn't been crushed psychologically. 
you know, so it's going to be really weird in Germany. So, uh, so, so again, and the German situation goes back to 1989 and 1980 with the wall coming down and LaRouche's proposal, which were supporting, which were also identical or, or largely identical to what the, the leading German elites were pushing as well. Many of whom were in touch with LaRouche and they got crushed. So, so the, it's also in that context that the exoneration of LaRouche could, could very well give a lot of these German networks that are not, that are not that are silent and are not doing anything, the courage to, to come forward with an actual positive economic plan for Germany. And this then further accentuates the need for LaRouche's exoneration. Now, I have an update on something that I'm involved in. <coughs> you can turn that off. I'm not ready for this. 